a shot of the bridge. It's so pretty outside. I know, I didn't realize we had a DT boat that somebody went out yeah. there. Yeah. Pretty sure that was a live shot from the Everybody's digital Everybody's really mad at that bridge being up though, did you notice? Oh yeah, that's yeah. a lot of angry, angry people. A live yeah. shot of angry people. Hello everyone, this is Digital Trends Live, our live show here every morning from Digital Trends, broadcasting live at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, bringing you all kinds of tech headlines and interviews, and as usual, did I say live? I think I did say live. We're live. So we're broadcasting on Facebook, Periscope, Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube, which means we can take your comments and questions throughout the show. Let's take a look at what's on the docket today. Coming up uh, during this hour broadcast, we will be talking to Caleb Dennison, our senior editor and uh, television guru, who's going to kind of recap a lot of what the uh, television news was from CES. So some of those big announcements like the, the rollable uh, OLED television from LG. We're going to talk about the micro LED from Samsung and maybe talk about some of the new integration with Apple AirPlay. All of that stuff we'll be covering, which means it's time to ask your questions because I know there are people out there with television questions. Don't forget 8K. 8K. Yeah. We'll talk about 8K as well. Yeah, 8K was huge, actually. I I didn't get much of a chance to look at a lot of them, but uh, I did. it's pretty good. It great. was awesome. It's yeah. pretty good. I kind of want 8K. A lot of people, like, um, I, I say whenever I I go to CS, everyone's like, oh, what's like TVs, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, honestly, like TVs have never been that impressive until 4K uh, OLED came out. And when I was changed the game for when you? I, yeah, when I first saw that at CS, I was like, ah, uh, picked my job up off the floor. Like it was yeah. so stunning and amazing. And I feel like AK is pretty much the same. It had the same effect on me. When like I was that at much CS. bigger of a bigger thing than AK. You can literally like, stand, your face is like this, and there's no pixelation. Yeah, like that's crazy. It looks realistic. It's I don't crazy. know if I'd want to be uh, shot in 8K. That's that. That's the. Like, You'd I mean, be glorious. <laughs> what are you <laughs> talking <single> about? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to talk to Caleb about that uh, coming up. We've got Ronan Glon, who's going to be on uh, from France, actually. He's back in France, but he was at CES, and then he was at the Detroit Auto Show. So he's going to kind of give us some highlights from the Detroit Auto Show and talk about those. And then uh, later on in the show, we've got the chief meteorologist from Fox News, but more importantly, for our purpose, is the founder and CEO of the Weatherman Umbrella. It's Rick Reichmuth. So he's an entrepreneur, created a smart umbrella, and he's going to be talking about that later on the show. So all kinds of things. And we are broadcasting live, like I said. So shout out to uh, Goof. 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 Goofy. Goofy. I'm not Goof. sure. He's been waiting very patiently. I did. I yeah. saw that. Yeah. yeah. So we just to, just to emphasize, we're live. We will read those comments and questions as they come through. I'm Greg Nibbler, here with Dan Gall. And uh, Dan, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's we, always fun. It is. It's fun, and we've got a lot of fun things to talk about today. So uh, why don't we get into what kind of our big trending story? You know, we like to lead off with whatever the biggest trending story is that I've seen throughout the day so far. And it's funny. It seems like retro tech has been a big, a big thing lately, and not necessarily retro, but maybe fondness for old brands. And Motorola Razor is actually. Uh, coming out with a new phone. It's going to be a foldable phone. So the Razer... The it has to be something. It's got to be something. Some type of clamshell. Right? Yeah. And, and so, and, and foldable screen, I guess I should say, because Motorola always was kind of foldable before that joke gets in there, because I know somebody's going to make that joke. Um, but the, the, there's, there's one of the commercials yeah. just with showing, showing the old original Motorola Razer, which God, was so huge. old looking. It way. was huge at the time. It was so massive, and it had such a huge splash. The design was amazing. It was so, like, futuristic looking. Yeah. Yeah. And now uh, it is, um, it's coming back. So the foldable phone, it's not going to be cheap. So the new Motorola phone that's going to be coming out is going to be $1,500. Real, real quick, did you see that hair swoosh? That yeah. Had it? Yeah, I got my razor. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> pretty badass. We need, to, we need to make commercials like that again. We need to make a digital Ret commercial. Talk about like retro that. phones. We need retro commercials like that. <laughs> <laughs> Get like lockers lined up in the hallways here. And yeah. Yeah, we do, clearly need to be doing that. Uh, but yeah, so the Motorola Razr, it's going to have an OLED screen, which is you know what you kind of have to have for those foldable ones. But they have a unique way that they're going to be doing it, or they're claiming anyway. It's, it's going to have a heated central hinge, so it removes any of the imperfections of folding the phone over. Self-healing. Se yeah, so yeah. self-heals, heats, and then Based off the heat, yeah. So like, I mean, that's the rumor, right? Like, yeah. Because I'm, I'm having such a hard time conceptualizing what this looks like. Because right. the first thing that comes to my head is foldable phone, two yeah. screens maybe, I don't know. It's really hard to imagine how, what's the width and the height, yeah. and then like actual foldable screen, that makes sense. But if you look at the ones 
um, that were at CES. Yeah, the, they the folded, Royal Flex Pie one. Yeah, they yeah. folded externally, so the screen would be on the outside when it folded. Yeah. Versus on the inside. Which seems like you would just scratch it instantly. Or, I mean, or that's what I think. And it's a sharp corner, like that's yeah. a sharp pinch. Yeah. So right? like, I'm really curious to see what it looks like. Yeah, uh, folding on the inside. Yeah, that would. That's a crease. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it doesn't fold on the inside. Maybe it's on the outside. Yeah. Oh. Okay. All right. Now we're all sorts of ideas lines here. Yeah. What do you guys think? <laughs> let us know. Uh, let us know if uh, if you would uh, you know if you if you're interested in this if you want to see what a foldable phone would look like if you want a foldable phone because I'm seeing some comments that have come through. Some people are definitely wanting it. Some people are not. Um, why foldable? Uh, Give just said. Question. Are they trying to bring back old school or? Yeah, I know. I think they're trying to trying to uh, capitalize on both. Um, you know my thoughts on that? Hmm. I think as phones get thinner, hopefully they get thinner, mm -hmm. folding it will take less space in your pocket. Like right now, like my phone, it feels like it goes from my kneecap to my hip. So like if it can take up less space in my pocket, yeah, I think that'd be awesome. Uh, they need to get thinner though. So I'm, you know, if it's folding and it's taking up, you know, double thickness of like an iPhone or something like that, that's just going to be weird. Right. Yeah, then it kind of defeats the purpose, and I don't think I would be into it at that point. But we'll see. I mean, this is something that they're, they're saying is going to be coming out. I don't think there's an actual timeline on when it will, but we're going to see a lot of people coming into the foldable phone market because Samsung still has theirs, although theirs is rumored to be priced, and again, just a rumor, around $2,500, which at that point, I mean, I don't understand why you would want it at that price. What's it I mean, do for you besides fold? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's it, yeah. yeah. I mean, if it's just to have, like, the cool new phone... All right, but twenty five hundred bucks. Does it yeah. make noises? Seriously. Yeah. Okay, that, then I'm in. If you get the transformer noise or a bionic man noise, okay, then I'm into it. Oh, That's... the bionic man. <laughs> okay, we'll stop doing that. All right, let's we have more things to get to. Let's talk about some read them and weep section, though. So this is our section every day where we take a look at some of the comments that have come through across the different digital trends platforms. I brought no tears today. <laughs> there will be no crying from Dan today. Attempt as you might. All right, let's go to our first one here. Super G50, all right? Regarding awesome tech you can't buy yet, uh, the Orcom Mime. Okay, I know what this is. The creepy camera will cause too much unwanted attention. Women or coworkers will assume you're recording them. You're actually not wrong on that one, Super G50. Zero. So it's it's this camera that you can kind of put in your pocket and just walk around and it films your day. But there is something a little bit creepy about it. I mean, because, it's just like Google Glass. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Except except that is it. It's not really tied to any particular sex. So like women or core workers. I mean. It could be men too, right? right. Like anybody's gonna be creeped out. A creep's by a creep. It. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And why are you pointing that at me? <laughs> What's like, up, dude? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does seem kind of strange. I mean, I, I guess you know, if like a GoPro or something, you know somebody's filming and there's a purpose to it. It's but never if, gonna work. Just filming your day. I don't this, know. This is never gonna happen until it's assimilated into standard cultural norms. And, right. and if you think about it, like I keep telling people, like the next. Like the way I see like technology going is like smaller and smaller. If you're talking about things that record your day and augmented reality, it's got to go through um, a lens of some kind. So like a, yeah, uh, contact lens. I think is the only way that that's going to be acceptable because people at that point will be like, it's they you won't just notice it. And It'll you just assume normal. that everybody has it? Yeah, because everybody's going to be like, that's how directions are given. Like, you're not going to have, like, you know, yeah. Google Maps on your phone. It's going to be going through a contact lens or, or something broadcasted onto your eyeball. There is, uh, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name off the top of my head, but there was that one that Julian Chocatu, mobile editor here for Digital Trends, he had a new set that was like the Google Glass, like that, that kind of line of, uh, of AR, but it looked better. Like it looked a little bit thinner. Yeah. Still, still, you can still tell that you know it's an AR set of AR glasses, but they project it onto your eyes. Yeah, but which the is, whole point is when people think the sole purpose of it is to record. Yeah. What you're looking at, it's ne that's never going to be it's acceptable. Gonna be, yeah. yeah, like it's, that's just people are going to be like, what the hell? Yeah, like, seriously. Because talk about you will never be able to have like trust with somebody, right? No, because like, vulnerability. Assume, you're like, oh yeah, yeah. Be like, hey, let's just have an honest conversation. Nope, it's being filmed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're halfway. Guess there right what now. Greg said. Let me show you. 
<laughs> I'm going to broadcast to the whole office yeah. right now. Yeah, I mean, it's it is going to be interesting to see how uh, how people fit. So anyway, bottom line, I guess, great comment. We can clearly talk about that for a while. Uh, Super G50. So let's go on to our next one, our next comment here as we go through our read them and weep segment, taking a look at what people say. William Johnson, okay, the Motorola Razor may return as a foldable phone for 1500. It was a foldable phone. <laughs> that is true. I uh, see. I already called that one out. I yeah. knew you were going to say that. Somebody was going to say that. Uh, so it totally was a foldable. Phone. It was a foldable phone. Foldable? It still is a foldable phone. Ah. <laughs> it never changed. Bad jokes. All right. <laughs> Let's go on to the next one. Oh, I do see this uh, on Facebook. Taking a look at some of the comments that come through. Guell says, I, I love that eye contact theory. So your theory about once it becomes into contact. Yeah. Which yeah. there are people with patents out on that right now. I think uh, there's probably multiple companies, but I believe Sony uh, recently um, said that they have a patent, like working on something with that. That's where it's gone. I think. Yeah. Like even in, in like cell phone, everything's going to, cell phones will eventually disappear. It's you gonna, think so? Oh yeah, it's gonna it has to. It'll and, just and go into the implant. Or it's gonna go like into yeah. It's gonna body modifications or yeah. uh, contact lenses. I mean, we're not that far away. No. To where you can actually have. I mean, we'll have five years. Like babble fish in your ear and yeah, Calling it five Alexa years. talking you. Yeah. Five years. Five years. Yeah, I think that's well. That's the thing. Once we reach the precipice where people are okay with body modification, like having that stuff, implants, and we're getting there right now. I mean. But you know, we're not all true Prindles yet, but once people start getting used to that, then I think it's full board. But a contact lens, you don't have to implant yeah, that's anything. True. You literally just put it in. Just right? slap it on. Like yeah. the people that don't wear glasses or contact lenses might be a little like, this sucks, but everybody else is going to be like, this is great. I get all this crap for free oh, and man. good vision. Man, yeah, yeah. we are, we're, we're on our way. We're on our way to that. All right, well, let's uh, continue on with the comments. We've got some really great ones that are coming through here. I'll, uh, I'll take a look here, and we will read all of these comments, so I'll get them I like on this the one from Gene Wong. From Gene, okay, uh, regarding Bell is building a self-flying air taxi. Yep, that'll fit right in my garage. It doesn't have garage. to. It doesn't have to fit in your garage. That's true. Yeah, it's, a, it's gonna be like the Uber of the sky, right? That thing was awesome. It was pretty impressive, yeah. and you can take a look at this at digitaltrends.com. We have a whole, we actually interviewed one of the designers of this, and it's, it is, it's, it's a giant air taxi. It's straight out of the movies. Yeah. Like, it doesn't look like a helicopter at all. It looks like a huge, drone yeah with looks- like seating for like 10 people i don't like the um they had a, a examples of what the the actual like autonomous ones were like they looked like something more for like dropping off amazon packages and things like that but i'm excited for this too yeah because that's where uber's going uh they already have like a trial going on down in like the dubai or yeah Emirates dubai or something I, like that i think they're gonna launch one in dallas I th- is is what i remember reading about it yeah but yeah flying taxis it'll change the way people live yeah. Right? Like, you don't have to live in downtown, in any downtown city anymore because it changes the way that you commute in. Yeah. As far as commuting, yeah, it will change everything. Oh, there's another a live couple of live comments that are coming through. Let's see. If it doesn't affect my health, I would be down for body modifications. Yeah. I mean, that's something to, something to think about. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of people that once they get used to this idea, you know, it's then it's then it's open season. Well, I mean, if it affects your health, that's a big problem. Right? Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. definitely a problem. That would end it. So but I mean, fast. you look at where wearables are going right now. Just with like the Apple Watch, they're trying to get funding for uh, I believe it's through Medicare, so that they can monitor for senior citizens to monitor health and trying to get the Apple Watch as part of that package. And you know, once you get started getting used to that, if it actually does have good. Um, you know, if, if it actually does provide good information, then people will be like, well, what's the difference if I just do a little well, quick topical surgery? And I know people think about privacy, but we really don't have privacy yeah. anymore. And at that point, th- there's uh, you have the, maybe the loss of privacy, but you have uh, other things being gained. So like yeah. health monitoring, uh, honestly, like if you think about it, like again, going back to contact lenses, you could have mm-hmm. like... Bionic vision, technically right. bionic vision, right? Yeah, we're turning into yeah superheroes. All the augmented stuff over your eyes, like it's yeah. all the futuristic stuff that's <laughs> coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You get you can make the sound effects. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everybody's just walking thing. around going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 all right, let's, we could we could do sound effects all day if that's what people really want. Uh, let's go on to it's our side job. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's go on to our next one. Anyway, Gene, that was a great comment. Uh, James Keeble. Ring security camera catches man licking doorbell for three hours. I don't recognize the face, but the tongue rings a bell. Oh, wow. Okay. That's, yeah. Oh, Wait. Oh, boy, yeah. Yeah. 
That that was pretty good. That was a solid. That was a solid dad joke on there. If you haven't seen that video, it has. It's one of the ring doorbells that uh, this man uh, licked the doorbell for about three hours. Just stood it's there. Absolutely disgusting. It's really disturbing. That first came up on PD Live. Uh, really? Yeah, that show PD Live. Um, I, I, it was like two weekends ago or something like that. That somebody first sh shared that one, because I remember we at CES actually we interviewed uh, Jamie, the founder of Ring, and he's the one that that's where I first heard about it. He's like, "Have you guys seen this?" Like off air, he's like, "I get sent all kinds of weird videos from from you know our, our doorbells." But he's like, "This one I can't unsee takes, it. Takes it's like it's stuck in my head forever now." <laughs> yeah. So PD Live is that police live show that airs on Fridays and Saturdays. And oh they, yes, they got called. To somebody's house. I have watched that show. For that. It's like live cops. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I, saw, I was like, oh my God. Like, first off, what kind of person goes up to somebody's house and does that? Yeah. And like, they didn't know who it was. Some people that lived there were like, we have no idea who this <laughs> guy is. That's the worst package thief ever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, he's got, uh, he's got the stamina. It's three hours he's there, you know, go. <laughs> that, that is. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, uh, if you Can we move on? That, yeah, it's just so you weird. See it. You're, you're a changed person after you see When you it, think so about we'll three hours. Three hours. Three hours. Wow. How do you sanitize that? <laughs> There's not enough bleach <laughs> in the world for no. that. Uh, Give right. me a new doorbell. <laughs> yeah, seriously. All right, next comment. Actually, this I saw this. This is the actual Detroit Auto Show. Replied to one of our comments. This was yesterday uh, when Adrian Warner and I were this in here amazing. talking about the Digital Trends Live uh, with the F Ford Butt Bot <laughs> test seat. <laughs> the for the Butt Bot. Which yeah. is a real thing. They call it the Row Butt, but it's meant to uh, test out seats. They called it your hot, sweaty butt on seats. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's yeah. basically, it's, it's a bit to stimulate or simulate. Going from doorbell liquor. Simulate. <laughs> this is the wrong, where is the show going? <laughs> this show's already off the rails. Yeah. All right. Anyway, you can read about it. <laughs> Drop it like it's bought. <laughs> I throwed a parachute on that one. So you can check that out at digitaltrends.com. But yes, the Detroit Auto Show following up with what we're talking about here on Digital Trends. So we do appreciate them tuning in. All right. We, we have time for a couple of news stories here. I feel like we need to get to these. And again, keep dropping your comments in here. Can we just start with Marty? We, we can, let's go straight to Marty. <laughs> well, we'll go straight to Marty on this one. So this has to do, um, you know, robots, obviously a big thing at CES. And I think we're going to see a lot more uh, robot assistance in the coming year. But this is an interesting one where it's a robot that's being deployed to a chain of grocery stores. They're called Giant, uh, Giant Foods, which it's on the East Coast. If you're on the East Coast, I'm sure you probably know about it. And starting off on... Um, I believe, well, actually this week, they're going to start rolling them out to 172 different stores in their supermarket chain. That looks super out. evil from the back, by the way. These assistant <laughs> robots called Marty with giant googly eyes. And <laughs> evil eyes on the back. <laughs> with evil eyes. <laughs> to remind you, do not trust them. Uh, but Marty, <laughs> is the idea behind this is that Marty the robot will roll around these stores and identify problems. So say there's a spill, it'll find a spill. Or say there's um, uh, pricing, it'll take a look at pricing and check that out and make sure everything's working right. And, and the, the whole goal they're saying is it's not to replace any humans. Marty, if he finds a spill, will just alert a human. <laughs> He'll be like, hey, there's a spill. Alert. 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 <laughs> Cheryl, there's a spill on aisle four. You know, so, <laughs> so, it's, so then the human still has to go and clean it up. I just don't get that. Yeah. Honestly, it seems like a, such a waste of money. It does. <laughs> like, like, Marty doesn't really do anything. No. He, he just rolls around with his googly he's eyes. He's going to get tagged. <laughs> like People are picking on Marty. Yeah. The store. They're going to slap like the sign on his back. <laughs> <laughs> What happens if they cover I'm his... I'm a dumb robot. <laughs> yeah, cover his sensor with, like, a RFID or something. I don't know, like, bar skip, barcode. Right, yeah, yeah, people, just kids are kicking him and then running around, running away from him. I just love how they call him Marty, and he's got these huge <laughs> googly eyes. Like, he's so, so safe. <laughs> you walk in, hey, Marty, how's it going? Right. There's a spill. All right, thanks. Thanks, Marty. It's just another day. <laughs> thanks, bud. He's really Eeyore. Stay away, kids. <laughs> yeah, so, so Marty, I mean... I think they plan on rolling out like 500 of them, right? 500 is the plan. 
500 of these. But yeah, it does seem pretty interesting. So Marty's equipped with scanners to avoid collisions and powered by rechargeable batteries. And it has multiple cameras. Uh, but but yeah, other than that, and other than reporting spills, it's pretty... Uh, do you think that's just what they're telling people? I mean, here's the conspiracy part. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what Marty's actually... He's really doing. looking for shoplifters. <laughs> yeah. He's going to so. tase them. <laughs> yeah, he's got powers. Um, I mean, the, the thing is, you know, I think we're going to see more of these out into different grocery stores because there's other grocery stores talking about like debuting assistance, but that's more for deliveries. This is Marty, the uh, the robot. You know, people are just going to mess with this. Like, they're, you know, he's looking for spills. They're going to put like some canola oil right down in front of him, and he's going to get he's going to get stuck. <laughs> he won't be able to move. <laughs> Cheryl, they did it again. <laughs> All right, let's get let's get to one more story here before we have to go to uh, to break. Um, this one is pretty fascinating, and I could see this happening because there's other companies that are trying this. And talking about satellite ads uh, being used as a, as a new form of advertising, using satellites for advertising for people down on Earth, meaning lighting up the sky with advertisements. This is a Russian-based startup. That, uh, that, that what they want to do is launch a series of these satellites and then it would, um, they, uh, it would put up these, uh, these basically giant lights, giant reflectors. They can like move around that into can different, move around, yeah. Yeah, into different formations and advertise them back down on Earth. They have this video showcasing it, you know, what it would look like saying hello. And then uh, yeah, McDonald's, McDonald's sign, logo going across KFC. Paris. Because boy... Uh, what better sight in Paris than to see a McDonald's logo floating oh, yeah. across That's the sky? That's gonna make people hungry. I love how too they showed <laughs> showed like the northern lights. You're way up there enjoying nature, like oh sweet KFC. <laughs> you know, yeah. Boy, by. I hope those lights come on. Yeah. Right? I do want some chicken nuggets. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's or twenty. This talking about like an invasion of advertising, though. I mean, this is this is going a step. To me, it's way too far. What do you what do you think about this? I think it's horrible, uh, but I also am like, if this really like goes live, like please, please, someone hack it and do something crazy with it. That's like, true. <laughs> Hackers will have a blast yeah. with that. Yeah, I just, I can't. I mean, like, there's such an. I mean, it's like the future. It's like the movies, right? Like again, it's like advertising everywhere. Well, like space, like advertising up in the stratosphere is. Yeah. Yeah, That's I don't know. Go. I, that would just piss me off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would be mad too. Right? But that's the, this guy is, uh, and there's a whole article about this. You can read this at Digital Trends. But they think they're going to be have the equipment ready and be ready to send this out and have corporate customers by 2020. Yeah. So next year, in theory, according to them, they would like you to be seeing this as it uh, as it goes across. I, I want to know how they test that. Like, and uh, and, not, yeah. and like uh, in terms of getting like numbers like effectiveness yeah like oh we, we we had a like you know 50 million eyeballs on it like how do you really know people saw that like what's the how are they gonna actually prove their worth yeah that's true i mean i it's gonna it's gonna piss a lot of people off it's gonna piss I mean, people off that'll definitely be part someone's of it. gonna try to shoot it and like obviously they're not gonna be able to get that far <laughs> and it's gonna come down and kill somebody i'm gonna shoot down that satellite <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're we're out of time. Kind of like when they were when they were trying to shoot the hurricane. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> you stay out of here, hurricane. I, I don't know why I go to that. I don't for know it. either. It's always. I think it's because of the Simpsons. Uh, so, all right, we need to go to a break. Dan, it is always awesome having you in here. Thanks for having this, me. This is too much fun. Um, maybe come in next week or something. We'll okay. Back in next week. Yeah, we'll work on that. All Everybody right. watching live, we're still here though. We have lots coming up. So, uh, what we're going to be doing here in just a few, we've got a great interview that's going to be joining, uh, that's going to be uh, happening with Rick Reichmuth to talk about his smart umbrella and just kind of the entrepreneurship it takes to develop a new umbrella. We've Oxymoron got more on there, by the way. What's that? Smart umbrella. Smart umbrella. Yeah. And we've got... Uh, it's another why question. That's it. Why? <laughs> well, we'll ask him that. And we'll take your comments and questions as we go through because we're broadcasting live on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube, which means, as I, can, as I said, we can take your comments and questions. And I believe we're probably going to have a lot for our next segment because we're going to be talking about televisions. So we've got Caleb Dennison. He's going to be hopping in here to kind of recap what he saw at CES this year in televisions. If you have questions about them, get those ready. And we'll be doing that next right here on Digital Trends Live.
we're back with Digital Trends Live, broadcasting live, taking your comments and questions. I see a lot coming in, and I bet we're going to have a lot more here in just a minute. I'm Greg Nibbler, now joined by Caleb Dennison. Hello, Caleb. Good morning. Good morning. You're looking snazzy in that shirt. I just want to compliment it. It's, <sighs> it's a good-looking shirt. Thanks. It yeah. was the only clean thing in my closet. Well, and yeah, now I'm wearing it. When we all won. I look fresh and clean. You do. You do. Yeah, like it's, it's a good look. Yes. An angel of Yeah, I didn't go that far. But let's do this. Let's talk about... I'm trying to change my image. I know. No, it's like an angel. Like Caleb Dennison, angel. Um, let's talk about televisions. So CES 2019, as usual, lots of stuff that went on. I mean, and there's tons of things that we could go over, but I thought maybe just for this segment, we could go over some of the highlights that you saw, some of your favorite things from CES. And then if there are any questions, maybe have those uh, answered. Uh, here live on the air. Sure, yeah. Uh, I need to get over a little bit of PTSD. As soon as you said CES 2019, something just <laughs> kind of <laughs> cringed. <laughs> the cringe. No, I'm, I'm, I kid a little bit. Like, the show was amazing, and we saw a lot of really cool stuff. And a yeah. lot of, and I'm not surprised to see there are a lot of questions about what was seen at the show. And right. um, even though a lot of it was uh, seen last year, in back rooms and yeah. a lot a lot kind of made its way to the show floor and it, it was super exciting um but it was also it just wore me out yeah it's a lot that goes out. on at that uh, i know you know you were live at the booth you know for hours and hours a day but yeah but um, you guys are going all over the place to take a look at all these and like you said you know last year a lot of i feel like what we saw this year a lot of it last year was kind of hidden behind you know, in secret rooms, like, oh, yeah, we've got a rollable television. Uh, we don't really want you to see it. Right. And you're not going to get it. And now that's one of the things that changed. The uh, LG rollable OLED television is something. It is a TV down. that you can buy. That's yeah. the big difference. Uh, you know, I mean, it seemed fully functioning when we saw it before, but there were a lot of details that were left out. This time we got those details. Um, turns out that the box that it's in is also a sound bar, which makes a whole lot of sense. Which does. Um, it's kind of an all-in-one deal, so it comes on its own stand. Um, and yeah, if you haven't seen this thing, it's pretty amazing. It, it seems so simple when you say it, but when you actually witness it happening. Yeah. And of course, they made this amazing uh, display, which was like five rollable OLEDs all going up and down in concert. And then the same thing on the other side of it uh, on the show floor. We, however, got to dig into it when we were at this uh, private suite in the Mandalay Bay. Yeah. That's the view that you see behind me right now, which actually made this video difficult to shoot because it was really bright when we started. And then the sun sank below. I was going to say lighting that. It seems like it would be tough. Oh yeah, it's not. It wasn't fun, but uh, fortunately, the OLED screen doesn't care, and that's part of the point. Like, yeah, uh, if you have this amazing view, uh, if you're blessed to have something like that, uh, you don't necessarily want to muck it up with the TV. So the TV disappears when you're not using it. It's pretty impressive. I will say that particular video, just on a personal note, my buddy was like, "Hey man, did you see this uh, rollable television from CES?" And he showed me the video. I'm like, "Oh yeah, that's Caleb." He's like. You know him? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, I do. Oh, like, you know I work for. Unfortunately, this yes. <laughs> Fortunately, I do know that guy. No, he was he was impressed. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I um I, I thought it was uh, really awesome technology uh, or use of the technology. OLED is yeah. you know uh, it, that's the thing is it can roll around, but it took them a while to figure out how to put it um, and how it. Uh, we do a really tight shot of the side so you can see how it kind of uh, breaks down as it goes in and, and rolls up. Really, really smart move from LG, I think. And that's something that will be on sale at some point this year. I don't think they've announced a price on no, it. No, we yeah. will not know about prices until about March. March, April, they'll say, okay, we're actually going to put it in stores at this time, and it's going to cost this much money, and it's going to be a lot of money. It's going to be a lot of money. A lot of the TVs that we saw <laughs> are just going to be ridiculous amounts of money. Yeah. Hopefully that'll drive everything else down though and maybe make so it you can get yeah affordable. one of your standard more standard television yeah cheaper absolutely uh, something else <clears throat> that was a uh, big I know for you at CES and I actually got a uh, best uh, best in show for televisions right was the Samsung micro LED right so you know the name of our award is best tech of CES yes. right and we like to uh, award it to, to products that we're gonna see in 2019 when we can we think that's the most practical type of thing to do right the reason I gave it to Samsung's micro LED this year is because it's the first legitimate competition to OLED. Um, it's just as black. It's way brighter. Um, it's an RGB structure, meaning um, it can 
put together amazing amounts of colors. Um, and what you, you see behind me in the, the clip right now is actually a 219 inch version of that with all the K-pop you could possibly want. Yeah, I was gonna want. say, it looks like you're right in the middle of a K-pop. Never been a K-pop fan, but that TV changed <laughs> my mind. Anyway, standing in front of it is just, it's amazing. It's uh, more brilliant than any movie theater display I've ever seen. Um, and that's the thing. You could put these in, uh, you know, modest sized cinemas yeah. um, and completely replace the projector thing. You don't need it anymore. Um, but the, the technology is, is finally arriving in homes this year. So somebody could buy the 146 inch version if they wanted to. I don't know if they're gonna roll out the 219, but the, the thing is they showed us a 75 inch version and that's much more manageable for a home. And yeah. I think um, the fact that they were able to, we, they basically proved me wrong. I wrote last year, there's no way they're gonna scale this down. Right. That's why it got no award last year because I was like, listen, until you can show me that this could actually come down to a size that most people could potentially put in their home. Would actually use. I'm not gonna take it that seriously. Well, they wouldn't prove me wrong. They showed a 75 inch version. They didn't get let us get very close to it, but it was very clear that they had scaled it down. That feat of engineering, I think deserved a little bit of acknowledgement. So. To, to where it's something that, you know, maybe you could end up uh, owning this. Yeah, I think for sure, in, for sure in for sure in 2020, micro LED TVs that you can put in your home will be out on the market, no doubt about it. All right, well there it is. So that was the Samsung side of things as far as what they had. I know there's a lot to cover. We've got just a couple of minutes here, right. but um, just talking about some of the other things that really stood out to you. I know outside of just, just the television part, the integration of Apple AirPlay was a big deal. Yeah, uh, nobody really saw that coming. Samsung yeah. announced it first, and Samsung does have an exclusive, so let's talk about that. Samsung, for a little while, will be the only TV company to have an iTunes app on its television, so you can actually click on an app, and then you can go and, and look at your collection of movies or TVs that you've purchased or you know whatever you want to rent from them. Mm -hmm. um, also, plays music, that means you can uh, play a whole bunch of 4K HDR and Dolby Vision content on, right All from the it. TV without touching it, anything else other than the Samsung remote. That will eventually end because we know that Apple wants to put its streaming service out there and when it does, I guarantee you they're gonna wanna have it available to as many TVs as possible. <clears throat> but then they opened up AirPlay 2 to virtually every other major manufacturer. Vizio was talking about it, LG's got it, um, and, and, and Sony's got it. So, Which is, a, it's a bold move by Apple. Yeah, and if, you're not, if you don't really understand what AirPlay 2 does, basically pull out your, your iPhone or your, uh, your uh, tablet, your iPad, uh, pull out your Mac, and you can uh, pick up anything that's on there, any movie, TV show, whatever, and just send it off to the TV, and it'll start streaming. And it participates in HomeKit. It's crazy. So it's part of Apple's smart home control system. Um, it can do multi-room audio as well, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, but nobody saw it coming. So for the first time, Apple, which has never gone to CES, came to CES as a sort of a Trojan horse inside all of these different televisions. So I'm gonna be watching what happens with that. Yeah, I mean, it'll be an interesting year just to see where Apple goes, because obviously trying to push their content too, I think is, you know. Oh yeah, no, that, they, they, they need to be in TVs. I mean, this is the first time that you could do any of that stuff without buying a $180 or $200 Apple TV 4K box, you know. Wow. I think you can still get the original Apple TV out there for quite a bit less. But still, that's a big investment. It's more expensive than a Roku uh, or a Chromecast or a Fire TV, and none of those things support Apple stuff. So if you're a part of the Apple Legion, you're stoked to hear about this. So much, and, and you know, just a lot to cover at, at CES. And like you said, I know you're still dealing with a little PTSD from it, but okay. but there's lots of articles that you can check out at Digital Trends uh, as well. I know I don't know if we had any other questions that uh, we had here that we wanted to cover as we're as we're going through here. Um, let's see, this Apple app on the TV. What is the smallest size TV which has this feature? Oh, there's uh, that's a looks like that's talking about the Black Mirror side. Um, yeah, what is the smallest TV that has that feature? So I'm that's not aware of anything smaller than 55 inches that's gonna have it. That doesn't mean that won't happen. It's just that what they show us at the show tends to be the bigger stuff. Um, we actually have an article on uh, digitaltrends.com right now that sh it, the name of the article is every TV that will have AirPlay 2 
in 2019. So if you so want to know, all out you there. can go and look at each and every single one. It's mostly talking about series of TVs, so Samsung QLED, um, LG OLED, LG Super UHD. It's actually NanoCell now. Sorry, LG. Um, but all the all the TVs 55 and up, up from every major manufacturer absolutely will have it. So much to cover, and like you said, that's a great article to go to to take a look there if you're to answer some of those questions that people have. Well, Caleb, thank you for hopping in here to talk about televisions. My pleasure. CES 2019, and all of that coverage is at Digital Trends. So if you want to want to be you know know what's coming out this year, that is the place to go and take a look at the videos for everything that you've seen. Some of it you might be able to afford, some not. I'm probably on the not, for some of them. It's fun but to But nonetheless, dream. they're still cool. They're still cool to, to look at. So all of that's coming up. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to be coming back with uh, Ronan. Ronan's going to be talking about what he saw at the Detroit Auto Show, which just happened. Lots of things to discuss with that. Stick right with us here. We'll be back in a second with more Digital Trends Live. Welcome back to Digital Trends Live, broadcasting live across all of our different platforms, taking your comments and questions, so make sure you drop those in there. I'm Greg Nibbler, and now we are going to be talking to Ronan Glan. I believe we have Ronan on right now. Hello, Ronan. Hi, how's it going? Hi. Uh, so excited to talk about automotive and, uh, and what you've been seeing over this last week at the Detroit Auto Show. How was it this year? It was quieter than usual, but there were still quite a few significant uh, new car introductions, especially compared to having just done CES, where it's a lot of talk about what's going on maybe early next decade. Detroit was all about what's going on in 2019, for instance. Yeah, I mean, with CES, it, it you know automotive is such a huge part of CES now that it is kind of interesting what what uh, the Detroit Auto Show can do to stand out from that and and to change things up. Uh, what did you see there that that stood out for you? Well, the the highlights, I think, were either the Ford uh, Mustang Shelby GT500 or the Toyota Supra. They're kind of competing for the number one spot in my mind. And there were quite a few other significant debuts, including the Cadillac XT6, the Ford Explorer, uh, Volkswagen Passat, which are cars that are not maybe as sexy as, say, a Supra, but the actual consumers are going to be buying in a few months' time. Well, let's talk about, walk through some of these, because that GT500, the Mustang, um, I want that. I don't know, uh, probably won't be getting that. But I mean, let's walk through. We've got some video of that and just taking a look at it. What, what's, what's new and impressive about this one to you? It's the most powerful version of the sixth generation uh, Mustang yet, and probably it's going to be the most powerful of uh, any sixth generation Mustang. But it's also the most powerful street legal car Ford has ever built. So it's even more powerful than the GT, which is a supercar aimed at Ferrari, for instance. Um, Ford hasn't released full uh, specifications yet, but we know it's going to have over 700 horsepower, which is a massive amount. That's a lot of horsepower. Yeah. Uh, did you get to try this out? Did you get to take it for a ride? No, not yet. I, think, I don't think anybody's driven that car yet. It was just barely introduced at the Detroit show. It was a, one of the shows 
better kept secrets, we'll say, compared to some of the other introductions which were leaked um, before the show. Wow. It, it, it is definitely impressive. So that's the GT500. And again, there's articles about all of these at digitaltrends.com. You can take a look at And since we are broadcasting live, if you have any questions and comments, drop those in there and uh, I'll make sure that we get those through. Uh, now, what about the Supra? So the Supra, I know for Fast and Furious fans, is a huge deal. Uh, why is Toyota bringing the Supra back after so many years? It's been like, what, 15 years? I think it's been about 15 years since the last Supra was sold, maybe even more uh, in the United States, because they retired the fourth generation model in the U.S. before the, uh, production and in Japan. I think the timing is right to bring back the Supra because the generation that grew up watching it um, uh, on Fast and Furious movies is now old enough to buy, say, a toy car, for instance, something that they, they're not going to drive every day. They're not going to take their families uh, to school in it. But right. They can have fun in it on the weekend. So the timing is certainly right. Uh, if there's one car from a movie or television show that you could own, what would it be? What would I own? That's a very good question. But, um, <laughs> I know that's probably a hard question for a, for an auto guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's a hard question to answer. There are so many that I would like to own. Honestly, the, this is not a very, I wouldn't take this on the track, obviously, but the Ecto class from Ghostbusters, I think would be my, <laughs> my top choice. That would be just awesome to go to the store in that. <laughs> that, would, that would be pretty sweet. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Could, I could definitely roll with that one. Um, all right, let's talk about a couple of these other cars here. Let's talk about the, I'm going to think about what mine is too. Uh, what about the Passat? The Passat is interesting because it competes in a segment that is really shrinking in the United States. The uh, It's a family sedan segment, basically. You've got the Honda Accord, uh, Toyota Camry. A lot of companies are pulling out of that segment. Ford is not going to make the Fusion anymore. Um, I think it's going to end production fairly soon, maybe 2020 model year, I believe. And Volkswagen still believes in this segment. And what uh, the president, Scott Keogh, said that was very interesting is that, sure, sedans are not as popular as SUVs. Uh, the sales are dropping. But the sedan market in the U.S. is still 4.2 million cars, which is bigger than the entire German car market by about 800,000 units. So it makes wow. sense to invest in that. Why is that? Why are sedans so big? Um, because it's still it's still just a very basic form of transportation that people yeah. who don't want to pay the premium to buy, say, a Tiguan or an Atlas will go to a Passat or, you know, you can say the same about Honda, about Toyota. People who don't want to pay the premium, premium to sit up high, basically, will still go to these sedans. All right. That's that's interesting. That's such a huge market here and not uh, in other places. And again, we are broadcasting live. Uh, so if you do have comments and questions, go ahead and drop those in there and we will make sure that we uh, cover those as we go through and, uh, and make sure that we answer anything that you want to hear. All right. Um, moving on to our next one here. Let's see. Taking a look at some of the other cars that that stood out for you. I know you there's a lot that you saw. Uh, what about the Nissans? So the Nissan, the IMS concept, it was one of the more futuristic cars on display at the Detroit Auto Show. It wasn't, it's not a production car. You're not gonna see this in uh, showrooms anytime soon, but certain elements of it might trickle down to production models in the near future. And what I think is interesting about it is that when you think of Nissan and electric cars, I think of the Leaf anyways, and it's not a very, it's not a very interesting or desirable car by any means of measurement. It's an electric hatchback. It's, you, you wanna drive it slow, get the most miles uh, out, of it, out of the driving range. And with the IMS, Nissan is kind of showing a different side of its of the EV segment and what it can do. So it's a, I think you've seen it. It's kind of a fastback like sedan. Some would even call it a four door coupe, which is not a term that I like, but it's it's more of a fastback. Think of Mercedes CLS, um, Audi S A7, that body style, not the segment. It's got about 480 horsepower, uh, all wheel drive. It's it's developed with autonomous driving in mind, so the steering wheel actually retracts into the dash when it doesn't need to be, when the car is uh, driving itself. Wow. So it's a very interesting take on the idea of an electric Nissan. It's some, it's different from what we've seen in the past. The steering wheel actually retracting in, I don't know why I already feel nervous just <laughs> thinking about that concept. You know, and I know we're, yeah. we're going to be having more autonomous vehicles and it's something to get used to, but the idea of it just it actually physically taking the control away from you. Yeah, it goes straight into the dash. I mean, it's like the dash is completely flat once the steering wheel is in there. Oh man, that's weird. Uh, how yeah. much of that did you see at the auto show? How many? How much of these, you know, these concept cars and um, conceptually, just as far as autonomous vehicles, how much was that on display? Well, the, the, the two mo the most futuristic concepts were the Nissan IMS and the Infinity, which is uh, owned by Nissan, and it was called the concept was called QX Inspiration, and it's also in the same vein, very futuristic design. 
entirely electric. There's no, you know, no range extender. It's not a plug-in hybrid. It's pure electric. And it was also designed with some form of autonomous driving in mind. The other concept that was interesting was the uh, Lexus LC convertible, but that's more of a, it's a very realistic design study that I think we're going to see in production sooner or later. This has not been confirmed, but my, my crystal ball in a way tells me that we're going to see this maybe by the end of 2019. And it's essentially a convertible version of the LC, which is the flagship version, the flagship car in the Lexus lineup. That seems a little bit more achievable than, than some of the other ones. Uh, it's yeah. just a couple of final questions here that I know we had on here. Uh, um, somebody's asking, what's the average price for the Supra? Average price, so pricing starts at, and this, it's a very interesting point, a good, good question. Pricing starts at $50,000. Uh, I think the official figure is 49,995 or something, but let's say 50 grand. But what's interesting is for the price, you get the three liter straight six engine, which uh, in, the Z, in the Z4, which is on the same platform as the Supra, the base model is also in the 50 range of memory serves, but that's a four cylinder turbo, it's a, a two liter turbo four. Buyers who want the same straight six as the as the Supra need to spend, I think, about sixty five or sixty sixty five thousand dollars. So it's quite, in terms of performance value, it's quite a bit cheaper than the uh, Z4 it's based on. That's interesting. Using the same basic concept, but that yeah, the pricing is so much different between the two of them. Um, yeah. So the the, the base uh, base Supra is fifty thousand. Uh, so this 3.0 premium trim, I believe, is 52, and there's going to be a launch edition limited to 1,500 cars. Uh, that's going to be about $55,000, and it's it's completely decked out. I mean, every feature you can imagine is in that car. It's exciting stuff, and it's always interesting to see how much of this, uh, you know, actually comes to fruition. How much we're actually going to see, you know, between yeah. the concepts and some of these new kind of bringing some of these older cars back, you know, with the Supra and the and and even with the Mustang to some extent. Um, so it's, it's really interesting stuff. And I know you've got a lot of articles up at Digital Trends that everyone can check out. And you see a lot of cars. You are probably going to be needing a uh, well-deserved break after going to CES and then the Detroit yeah. Auto Show and now flying all the way back home. Um, but Ronan, thank you for, for hopping on here and take some time to walk us through some of the stuff that you saw at the Detroit Auto Show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, there we go. So live coverage uh, with Ronan talking about the Detroit Auto Show and some of the things that he saw here on Digital Trends Live, uh, bringing you all kinds of news and interviews. And we've got more coming. So we are broadcasting live. We can't take those comments and questions. It's really fun to ask those when we have the guests on. And up next, we're going to be joined by Rick Reichmuth. Rick Reichmuth is the founder and CEO of Weatherman Umbrella. So a new form of umbrella. It's Smart Umbrella. Smart, a, t a tech umbrella. A, it's it's going to be kind of interesting to talk about him taking it from a concept all the way to production and where we're at with that. Also, he's the chief meteorologist for Fox News, so he knows a little bit about weather. So we're going to be coming back here in just a second with more Digital Trends Live, talking to Rick Reichmuth right here with you. See you in a minute.
Welcome back to Digital Trends Live, broadcasting live every day, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, bringing you all kinds of tech headlines and fascinating interviews, and we can take your comments and questions as we're broadcasting. And I'm really excited to welcome our next guest. He is the chief meteorologist for Fox News and the founder and CEO of Weatherman Umbrella. It's Rick Reichmuth. Hello, Rick. How's it going? You said my name very well. Good, thank you. I, I made. I tried to make sure I researched beforehand. <laughs> That's always a success when you get that right. Um, but let's talk about. There's. I mean, I'm so excited to talk about the umbrella, just especially from a tech standpoint and an entrepreneurial standpoint. But. I kind of wanted to walk through, maybe have you walk us through your career because it's a really fascinating uh, ride on how you started out and how you got to this point of being an entrepreneur. Can you walk us through that? Sure. It's it's not a very direct line and mostly <laughs> accidental at every turn. Uh, but yeah, so I um, I initially got my degree in Spanish literature from Arizona State while I worked at Bank of America was a branch manager of a Bank of America retail branch uh, until I was 30 years old and uh, did not like any of that. <laughs> and, um, then when I was 30, I thought, OK, I really don't like this path I'm on. I need to do something that I want to do. Uh, so oh, I went back to school, studied okay. meteorology. Did I, did I lose you? Uh, we lost just for a second, but uh, I, we were at uh, not liking banking and then, uh, and then from there. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, when I was 30, I decided to uh, just quit the bank, change careers to try to pursue something that I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to be a weatherman, so I thought I would just try to see if I can figure it out <laughs> um, and uh, then did. And so um, a, a turn of great, you know, serendipity and luck and uh, ended up getting a job uh, initially at CNN with some really supportive bosses. I was basically a secretary and they let me um, practice on the weekends and evenings and mornings uh, in front of the green screen. They critiqued my work. I started taking meteorology classes and uh, eventually they got super desperate on headline news one day and, and threw me on air <laughs> and uh, that and it worked. By the time I was 36, um, I got offered a job in New York at Fox News and uh, have been here ever since. That's that's one of those great stories of, you know, fake it till you make it. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you, <know, laughs> you just keep trying and eventually it's going to happen. And yeah, fake it till you make it and know what you don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's along with that really importantly. Well, it's talking about that side of it. Let's talk about jumping into the entrepreneurship side. So, I mean, none of these backgrounds really sound like inventor or, you nope. know, knowing, <laughs> knowing that side. So how do you get into that that section? Yeah, also a, a little bit accidentally in a sense. Um, so it, it, this whole thing around an umbrella started uh, probably about seven or eight years ago now. I was trying to buy an umbrella and standing in front of a rack of umbrellas at a store. And I thought, uh, I know that they all suck, but <laughs> maybe there's a good one in there, but why don't we know what it is? And I thought, you know, it kind of in every other vertical, you know what the quality version of that vertical is, um, but we don't know what that is around umbrellas. And so at that moment, I thought, well, I'm a meteorologist and on a national channel, I bet I could tell people what the good umbrella is. And uh, so that began just a process of trying, A, to make a good umbrella. Um, and that was kind of the first step. And it was kind of all I really thought of. Um, I realized in the process that the other thing that happens with an umbrella is if you're going to invest in a good one, and I wanted to make a good one that would obviously have to sell at a bit of a higher price point. Uh, the other problem you have is you leave your house without your umbrella, and then you lose your umbrella. So I thought, how can we mitigate that? So I thought, let's make an app to give people uh, an alert on days you need your umbrella. You kind of program it, tell it when you leave your house in the morning, uh, and then we give you an alert to say if you need to take your umbrella or not. That way, if it's sunny when you leave, but there's going to be storms at three o'clock, you know, we can tell you take your umbrella. Which um, is which is smart because I, I don't know how many umbrellas I've lost. I'm sure that's a common story for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And not only lose, but you just don't take it. So then you buy another, you know, disposable two block umbrella uh, that, you know, at that point you need in the afternoon. So then I thought, let's put a, a tracking device with it so that you can at least help you locate where you last had it. So to try to help you have that umbrella with you when you need it and it's the best umbrella you know that you can find that was just the basic concept ar around it um everything up to the point of launching this product was really just like a puzzle 
that was a thrilling process of how do you make an umbrella? I took, you know, a friend of mine who's an industrial designer, we took hundreds of umbrellas apart in the apartment, um, just figuring the weak points, where they could be strengthened, what makes umbrellas break, flip, all those things. Um, and then what are the other things that are annoying an umbrella, like the handle feels gross or it's forcing your hand into some uncomfortable position. Um, there's safety features. We put reflective piping around it so that, and our logo is reflective. So at night, if uh, you don't, you know, you're tucked under your umbrella, you don't see cars as easily. Cars don't see you, especially, I live in New York. If you live in a, a dark place and you have a black umbrella. So um, safety features around all of these things. Uh, anyway, all of it was a fun puzzle. How do you start a business? How do you uh, make a website? How do you sell the product? How do you market it? All of these things was a fun puzzle. And it turns out by the end of that, I had a business and was an entrepreneur. And that part of it, I never really thought about in the process. Um, I, I think it's really interesting, you know, just that process, but then also taking something that seems like such a common uh, item, you know, and we all have umbrellas and you're right. Most of them do suck. I mean, right. I, but you're just used to it. It's just like, oh, okay, well whatever that's what you have to deal with with an umbrella yeah. and then i'm picturing you with a living room with you know 900 umbrellas yeah. all taken apart in pieces <laughs> um, yes. figuring out what's right and what's wrong with them so the it's it's really uh really cool you know making a high end umbrella but then there's also the app that goes with it yes so what yeah. walk us through that so interesting i i'm sure people who are follow you understand this a lot more i think the digital space in the app was much more difficult piece of it is is really difficult to get right and i think we're still in that process as you should be of evolving your product to, to, to improve it as it goes um but it is the thing that i think is the most exciting one thing was wanting to make a great product which is the umbrella um the other thing is what can you do with that and i'm a meteorologist so what can you do with that to improve forecasting and to get better information out to to the consumer uh, one of the things that I think people in the U.S. take for granted is we have the best forecasting and the best weather information in the U.S. better than any other place uh, around the globe. We've invested money into that. We have satellite, uh, better satellite coverage than any other place. We have more local weather stations send out more weather balloons than any other place. And because of that, we have a lot better forecasting, even though people still like to make fun of our forecasting skills. But, uh, you know, we're, we, we have great information. That said, your information that your, your forecast is only as good as the inputs into that forecast. And so we now believe that we are and where we are working towards the next generation is to create better information, more points of information coming in to help improve forecasting going out. And I think you see uh, you saw this, you know, with IBM announcing their big initiative at CES last week. Uh, and there's a, a space that we're hoping to be in that kind of area around improving forecasting um, with what we can do with the app and, and gathering more weather information. Well, it's it's so exciting, you know, just I'm excited for you for creating this and it's such a really cool, interesting story. The product sounds amazing. We need to get some in here at Digital Trends because we're in the Northwest, so. That... Yeah, I thought you had one. We'll, we'll make sure you have one. Sweet, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, well, Rick, I want to say thank you so much. So where can people go to uh, to order one, to, to get their own Weatherman umbrella? Yeah, so right now we're just uh, direct to, to consumer brand, so just e-commerce, and it's our website, which you said, weathermanumbrella.com. Fantastic. So, Rick... Weathermanumbrella.com. Weathermanumbrella.com. Go there, get your umbrella. Rick, thank you so much for joining us today uh, to talk thank about you. all of this. Thank you. Great talking to you. Fantastic. Well, everybody listening live right now, watching live to Digital Trends, I want to emphasize that again. We're live every day, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, bringing you all kinds of tech headlines, interesting interviews, finding out all kinds of different things. Today, you know, just walking through a little bit of it, we had Caleb Dennison in to talk about some of the television at CES. I'm sure you have lots of questions still about that. You can go to digitaltrends.com or follow us on YouTube or any other platform and make sure you get uh, all the information you want to get on there. You can check out all the videos. Uh, we had Ronan talking about the Detroit Auto Show, all of those really 
cool cars. We've got write-ups, videos, all of that on site as well. Uh, of course, Dan Gall in here at the beginning to talk about Marty the Robot and many other things that we were covering here at Digital Trends and doing it all live, talking to you. And thanks to everybody who tunes in. Hit subscribe. Wherever you're watching, hit that subscribe button to make sure this uh, pops up every day for you so you can join us and walk through whatever exciting things that we're going to be talking about each day. And there's always, always fun stuff that we're going to be discussing. I'll say this. If you are watching live at 2.30 p.m. Pacific, we'll be back with Trends with Benefits, our roundtable tech podcast. We've got comedian Jeremiah Coughlin is going to be joining us, talking, I think, probably some more robots, but we'll definitely be taking your comments and questions as we go through that as well. I'm Greg Nibbler. Thanks for watching, and we'll be back tomorrow with more Digital Trends Live.